At this time, I'd like to welcome our guest for the evening, Young Pueblo, also known as Diego Perez. Diego Perez is a meditator and a number one New York Times bestselling author who is widely known on Instagram and various social media networks through his pen name, Young Pueblo. Online, he has an audience of over 3 million people. His writing focuses on the power of healing, self-healing, creating healthy relationships, and the wisdom that comes with uh, the wisdom that comes when we truly work on knowing ourselves. His first three books, Inward, Clarity and Connection, and Lighter, have had great impact, selling over one million copies worldwide, and have been translated into over 25 languages. Diego's fourth book, The Way Forward, that's available for sale uh, with us uh, at the rear, uh, was just released in October uh, on the 10th of 2023. Please join me in welcoming Young Pueblo, Diego Perez. Thank you. Thank you all so much. Is this, does it sound fine? Good. Um, this is such a strange and like big moment. I'm like, for one, first things first, I'm so happy that I can see all of you. I just finished being on tour and I was in on the West Coast and we would have these big event spaces full of people and all I could do is hear them. I couldn't see them because the lights would be so dark that I would only be able to see the first row of people. So I can like hear them move with the words but not physically see their faces. So it's a treat to be able to see everyone. Um, the other thing is like, I'm just like a little indigenous dude writing his heart out. So it's really strange to be speaking at Brown. Um, so thank you for welcoming me. Um, I think that before I read a little bit from my book, just a l from my background. So I was born in Guayaquil, Ecuador. Um, I, you know, straight up came from the gutter, like, my family was incredibly poor in Ecuador. Um, we, my parents realized that there was not much opportunity there for us other than struggle. Um, so they tried to, they took a big gamble and moved us to the United States. We ended up landing in Boston. Um, so I got here when I was four years old and it was such a dramatic change that, um, you know, at the time it all seemed normal, but there was such anguish in being apart from our family and all of our, you know, I have like 50 cousins, so many aunts and uncles, and this vast network of even though we were in this great struggle, we were in the struggle together and being apart from that and being in this micro struggle, trying to move, um, find out a way to get out of this, you know, American poverty trap that we were so intrinsically t inside of for years until my brother, you know, turned 22 years old and got a job and was able to add his own little bit of pay to the family pay. And same thing when I got older and started making money. So it was this massive struggle that we were in for such a long time. Uh, my mother, she cleaned houses. My dad worked at a supermarket. So we were, it was like classic American poverty trap. Um, and I think through all of that, all of that was, you know, felt really normal. That's all I knew. But I didn't realize how much anxiety and sadness and all of the scarcity that I saw, all of the fighting that I saw between my parents trying to figure out how we were going to pay rent, how they would add more food to the fridge, this continuous struggle, you know, it just had a big impact on me. And I wasn't able to notice that all these imprints were adding up in the subconscious of my mind, creating this disposition for me to again and again have so much sadness, so much anxiety come up. And I had no way to process it. You know, this is way before the popularity around wellness, way before even therapy or meditation has, you know, reached this new level that it has now. Um, so it really, I came to a breaking point where when I, so I went to Wesleyan University and to mediate my own emotions, what I did was just, you know, partied excessively, consumed so many drugs, just really took my body to the absolute edge. And after I graduated from college, I was aimless, was still trying to do the same things, mediating my emotions through intoxicants. And 
it took my body and my mind to a breaking point where I almost lost my life. Um, and in that moment, there was so, you know, it, literally the moment of almost losing my life. There was so much anguish in that moment, but I kept seeing my parents. I kept seeing how much they gambled for us to have a chance. Like, I, not even, there's no certainty. Because I remember, I remember growing up in Boston, there were so many family friends who their families made the same gamble and they were not successful. Like so many of my friends went to jail. So many of like, you know, friends, people that I knew were shot, killed, or, you know, something crazy would happen to them. And in that moment, I thought to myself, you know, I don't want to die like this. I need to find another way. And I realized that the reason that what got me here to this moment was that I had been lying to myself. I, I, I didn't want to admit that I didn't feel good, that I had a problem inside. And once I started telling myself the truth and challenging myself to sit with these tumultuous emotions, the change started. And it was very little at first. But once I started facing my emotions, a year later, I started meditating. This like floodgates of creativity started opening up. And what I attribute that to is the fact that healing is it's possible. I mean, we're all very different. We all have very different contents in our mind, different, you know, traumas or hurt that we carry. But being able to experience that within myself, that it is possible to alleviate that density of the mind and then have these beautiful externalities, these beautiful things arise where my relationship with my now wife improves so much. The relationship with my parents was able to blossom and become more vibrant. I was able to start enacting and expressing and understanding my healing through creativity, which I felt like I had no access to beforehand. So I think that's really sort of the crux of where I'm coming from and, and why I write is because um, healing is possible. I'll read you a few pieces before we dig into the conversation and I answer some of your questions. Be honest with yourself about where you are going, how you want to feel while you are heading there, and who you want to be when you arrive. Every moment is a destination, an opening, a space for growth. The end goal should not distract you from taking each step with intention. I want to love everyone without judging them, without placing anyone on a scale of better or worse, to first see the good in people and treat them with kindness and attention. I want to give without worrying about what I will get in return. I want my mind to feel comfortable, radiating love to the entire world. I want to gently hold myself to a higher standard without forcing or rushing. You know the inner work is paying off when you can see your ego trying to make a mess of things. But you have enough resilience and awareness to choose peace instead of chaos. Your intuition will lead you outside your comfort zone so that you can grow. What can you do to connect with your true purpose and gifts? When you start turning inward to heal and let go, you remove the layers of heavy conditioning and trauma that have been blocking your natural creativity from coming forward. When your mind is lighter, it will more easily connect with its talents and genuine aspirations, and you will find a way to use those talents to serve others. Everyone who is healing their old trauma and learning to live beyond the past is part of the solution. Ask yourself, in what areas of your life do you find yourself clinging to control? How would being more open to change affect your relationships? Is there an unchangeable situation that you are working on accepting? 
What can you currently do to love yourself better? In what ways have you been living intentionally recently? Emotional maturity is not handling everything on your own or being beyond your emotions. Emotional maturity is feeling tough emotions without feeding them or projecting your tension onto others. One of the most important skills to develop in a relationship is knowing when to step back and give your partner space when they are having a tough time or when to step up and give active active support. The type of love they could use to help them through their process will not always be the same. Eleven personal commitments. Live with gratitude. Believe in your power. Self-love is not optional. Heal at your own speed. Don't glorify being busy. Don't rush important things. Stop doubting your progress. Only commit to what feels right. Use boundaries to help you focus. Listen when your intuition says yes. Put your energy into your highest goals. And the last one, realize how short the walk is from gratitude to happiness. Thank you. Oh, wow. (laughs) Hi, Diego. Hey, thanks (laughs) for having me. Thank you for being here and for sharing these wonderful, uh, wonderful words. Uh, I'm, I'm struck by just how approachable and accessible mm-hmm. the, the the writing is uh, but even more so just the, the the wisdom that each word contains so we'll have a chance to talk a little bit about that and have a bunch of questions so bear with me here very excited for it uh thank you for sharing your also your just opening uh, a mm-hmm. little bit about your, your background and uh, uh I, I i imagine that there's many aspects of your personal story that uh, resonate a lot for our audiences as well. I'm going to ask a little bit about uh, the process of becoming young Pueblo as, mm. as a figure, as, as I mean, a historical figure, but also just as a person. What led you to become young Pueblo specifically? That Talk about that uh, transition from or that relationship between being Diego and yeah. Jan Pablo. Um, I think it's really interesting. There's a bunch of things that went into the, that name coming to fruition. I think a lot of it is that, so I grew up in the inner city in Boston. So I grew up like right at the crux of reggaeton and hip hop, right? So like all this is coming together. This is what I'm listening to growing up to. Um, and the name, the when I first signed on to Instagram the first time before it even became a a writing account. It was just my personal account. That was the name. I was like, Young Pueblo just came forward. That name later took on way more meaning. And it felt sort of like intuitive, magical. Um, There was a moment where I was, uh, I lived in Ecuador for three months in 2014. And I wanted to spend time there right before um, my wife and I moved to New York City because I didn't know my grandmother, right? Like I had left so early and she was about 92 at the time. And I wanted to just spend time with her for me to get to know her, for my wife to get to know her. And um, in that time, you know, we're like, I'm learning so much about my culture, like this culture that's like in my blood, but I can feel it, but I don't know about it. And um, I end up finding out that like Pueblo for my people, like, right, people use that word in so many different contexts. But for my people, it's like it refers to the economically impoverished people, you know, that um, like Pueblo, like the Pueblo is like it's like the people. Um, And there's also this figure in Ecuador, Juan Pueblo, which is uh, they have a little statue of him in the Malecón in Guayaquil. And when my cousin took us there to see it, I was so shocked. I was like, oh, I I had no idea Juan Pueblo existed. And this was like 
two years after I, you know, had made the name. And when I started meditating more seriously, Young Pueblo took on a whole nother meaning where I started realizing like I'm massively immature. Like through meditating, I saw I'm like, whoa, like I have so many things I need to work on. And I've always been a fan of trying to understand history at macro levels. And um, I started turning my attention there and I was like, wow, I was like, we, humanity is really immature. Like as a human collective, we're really, we have a lot of growing up to do. And I always think about the example I always give is when you send kids off to kindergarten to like the first time they're being schooled, people are trying to teach them the most basic things, how to clean up after themselves, to not hit each other, to tell the truth, to share, to be kind to one another. These are like human fundamentals. And we know how to do them as individuals. But as soon as we get to the collective, the giant macro levels, we fail at them. We totally fail at these basic human fundamentals. And to me, that is a clear sign that humanity as a whole is still in this transitional point where we're learning the basics and we're still growing up. So young pueblo to me literally means young people. And it's not like young people, like you're 18 or something like that. It's like, we're all, we're all very young. Great. Thank you. Um, my next question here is, uh, wants to talk a little bit about writing specifically, yeah. uh, and writing being your chosen creative medium. Perhaps you have some other talents you can uh, share with us, but we know you for your writing. Can you talk about why writing specifically, uh, why this medium uh, as your mode of expression uh, for your message? And how'd you get into it? Yeah, thank you. I think writing, it felt so comfortable because it's, it's art that's always in flux, right? So you put in one, you can put together a particular set of, of words and watch meaning that you're trying to reach evolve over time. You know, when I look at my first book, my first book was trying to reach what the way forward was talking about, but it took a lot of individual learning, a lot of internal unbinding and healing on my part and developing my voice as a writer um, to be able to get there. And it literally took, that's my, so it took four books to get there. Um, and it's cool. It's like that, but that doesn't devalue the first one. You know, the first one for us, uh, there are a lot of people who love that book, but they love that one more than all my other ones, even though I personally am like, this one is my favorite. Like to me, if you were asking me, what's your favorite? I'd be like, the way forward is the best one. If you're going to read something, but um, other people would disagree. So, but I think that's great. You know, people are, they're connecting with whatever it is that they're connecting with. But I think the medium of writing is just, it's a way to process. It's a way to reflect. It's, um, it's one of the most accessible modes of developing your self-awareness. I think stepping into a room for therapy, that's tough, that's hard. Like stepping into like a meditation hall and sitting down and just being with yourself for hours, that's also really hard. So the barrier to entry to use writing as a means to grow, it's still hard, but it's not, you know, for some people it won't be quite as challenging. And different people, depending on the conditioning that you carry, the traumas you may hold, Different people need different tools. And that's a beautiful thing to understand. Um, but I think writing is like, it's just beautiful because it's flexible. Okay, great, wonderful, thank you. I wanna talk a little bit about writing for a broken world, which is yeah. uh, the name of this series. Uh, and um, the- Perfect timing, right? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, and we wanna hear a little bit more about what that mm -hmm. concept means to you. Um, as a writer who yeah. writes for a broken world and uh, encourages us to heal. Yeah, I, I've been, you know, this, the, the, the realization that healing was possible was so shocking to me. Like I grew up in a way where if you had any type of mental difficulty, physical difficulty, you were just going to have to live with that for the rest of your life. So to go into, you know, trying to, architect my habits into a, something that could better support my happiness and then eventually stumbling upon meditation and seeing the results of how like that's actually making my mind feel lighter like I'm not perfect I'm not you know I still have a bunch to learn so many ways I can grow so many ways I can improve 
but the density of the minds, the heaviness of anxiety, the heaviness of emotional, you know, emotional tumultuousness, it's there, but it's not as it's not as thick as before. And to me, it felt like such a victory. And when I think of healing, I think of it as you know you're healing when the intensity of your reactions is less than before. Like you're st- you're still reacting, right? Reacting is like this embedded survival mode mechanism that helps us, you know, get through difficulty. But when the reaction is less than before, when you react with sadness and it's less intense than before, you react with anger and it's less intense than before, that's a big win. And I think that's what propelled me into writing in the first place because I saw that, like, you know, it felt like I was so motivated not to tell people, oh, come meditate. Like, if you want to meditate, great, you should. It's fantastic. But more so shout from the rooftops, healing is possible. Like this thing that people never really, like my doctor never told me this, you know, it's, it always felt like we were trying to just deal with symptoms, but never get to root causes. But I felt like I was starting to get to root causes in my own mind. And I started seeing that in the people around me as well, that they were fundamentally changing themselves. And I've seen the benefit of that, even in my own family, where like, I'm a serious meditator, but I have other family members who have benefited so much from seeing a psychiatrist, you know, other family members who've benefited so much from journaling, from, but from developing a point of self-awareness. And in terms of where we are in history, you know, whether you want to think about this current moment that we're in or the macro movements of history, to me, it's such a special time that we live in and it can become so gray and dark, right? The difficulties of the moment are so clear, but what keeps me having hope is that like, how is it that when we have the biggest challenges humanity has ever faced with climate change, with economic inequality, all these different moments when war bursts onto the surface, at the same time, there has arisen this net of modalities that wasn't quite available the same way it was before. We still have a long way to go in terms of accessibility, but we've come a long way. You know, these Western practices have become quite globalized, different forms of therapy, different forms of psychiatry. In the same mode, different forms of Eastern practices, different forms of meditation have become globalized. And people have access to these tools that are like really changing their lives. So to me, when I think like, the world is dark. It is. It absolutely is. But I have hope that we can continue transforming ourselves and that we can actually keep using that energy. Because historically, there have always been movements of people gathering around a common cause, trying to change the world into a better place. But to me, this is the first time where we can not only keep moving as a, as a group to change the world and become a better place, but we can bring in that internal transformation that would help balance that and make our actions ever more creative and ever more peace oriented so that all can share in harmony as opposed to just some. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) For sure. Uh, um, And absolutely. I mean, the, I mean, what you describe in your, in your work um, and just even what you're sharing here, I mean, really reflecting on how, uh, Given the intensities of what we're all sort of collectively experiencing, mm-hmm. what you're suggesting is that they're sort of in equal measure opportunities to to handle uh, to find a pathway forward. Yes, and and the the example I like to go to often, right, is that like power it has a terrible effect on the mind, right? Power will pull out the deepest, darkest roots of the ego and bring them to the surface. And you see that again and again. If you study different movements, sometimes groups will try to change the world or try to change their locality and they'll win. And then it doesn't always look pretty when they win. I think one of the um, examples is like the French Revolution, right? Like people are trying to make republics. People are trying to bring rights and create something new. And then they won. And then a massacre happened. It was like so many people were beheaded for such an extended period of time, literally tens of thousands of people that the streets were just full of blood. And to me, I think 
we have to understand that that sort of mode of ignorance and harm and trauma, like it's inside of all of us. But if we take the time to do our inner work, if we take the time to do the unbinding work, because that's a lot of what we need to do is decondition the mind, then that's going to help elevate our self-love. And you only know that self-love is really real, not just because you're taking care of yourself well, but because it starts opening the door to unconditional love for all beings. So it's not just like, oh, you perfectly love all beings. No, but it starts opening the door to unconditional love to all beings. And that will re help remove that motivation to harm others. And I think that's um, something that can be activated in every human being. Wonderful. Thank you. Uh, my next set of questions has to do more, I want to stay on the topic of, of writing, uh, but to get a little window into your writing process, your inspiration, perhaps uh, how you go about structuring and just planning for uh, your book projects. Um, so if you could share with us what a typical writing day looks like for you. Sure. Um, a lot of the writing happens in the morning or like super late at night, um, like right before bed. Um, so I'll wake up and and usually use that time to, you know, either write something for my sub stack or write a few smaller pieces or, or work on whatever writing project I have at that moment. And but that also comes with waves. So like I have learned over time to not be so strict with myself where it's like I can't wake up and be like every single day I'm going to write five pages because if I force myself to do that every single day, a lot of those are going to be nonsense. Like it, it's I have to move with the creative energy. So I've been learning just like when I feel it, like I've learned to be able to feel that creative flow and the, and the ideas coming together. So in those moments, I try to catch it and then just either quickly jot something down on my phone if I'm not in front of my computer or try to capture it, you know, especially if it's more long form things. And I mean, my, my primary inspiration, especially in the beginning when I was trying to develop my voice as a writer, and that's that's the hard work. I feel like if you're, especially when you're, um, like I had to teach myself to not write in academic ways. It took a long time. I was like, okay, I want to talk to a lot of people, not a few people. Mm -hmm. So I have to just really speak clearly, like as clearly as possible and start speaking through the language of emotions as opposed to, you know, like um, just like deeper academic learnings. And like they all have their value, right? They're all, they're, they're all valuable, but... If you want to talk to a mass audience, you got to speak straightforward. Um, so to be able to cultivate my voice as a writer, uh, Herman Hess was like my backbone for sure. Like I read all of his books and I was so enamored with his style of writing and what he was writing about. But when I realized that I really wanted to take writing seriously, I started reading his books for an, like with an eye for structure. You know, like how is he using his semicolons like how is like how is he formatting his paragraphs and how how is he maintaining a lyrical quality while he's you know writing about such big important topics and um it was so funny because when i wrote my third book later um i was in the middle of writing it and my editor was like dude he was like why do you use your commas like that you know and he's just like and he's trying to come at me and i and i was like oh it's like because you know i got so much inspiration from herman hess and he was like, don't write like a German from the 1920s. Like, don't do <laughs> And he's like, you need to start replacing a lot of these commas with periods. And I was like, all right, I got you. So it's, it's an evolving situation. Yeah, there's always more to learn. Well, I, I'm going to uh, pull that thread a little bit uh, and extend it to ask, what happens? I mean, I don't know if, if you've ever had the experience where you go back to earlier writing and a cringe moment happens. How yeah. do you, okay, that, okay, that happens to yeah. you too. Okay. Can you talk a little bit about how you work through that? I think I, um, I've learned to like, you just got to let it go. Like there, sometimes you, you will write and you just make a mistake. Either there's either a, an actual mistake in the book or you say something accidentally that's similar to something else that someone said that you never read or or you like, there's so many possibilities to mess up, especially when everyone's watching. And even when there's no intention of messing up, like it's the, the, the opportunity to mess up is plentiful. So I think um, I'm like, especially hard on my first book inward. Like I, I think that book, I mean, it, 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 gave, it changed my life. It opened up so much opportunity and it, and it 
I think it helped a lot of people. A lot of people have written to me about how much they love that book. But when I read it, I'm like, oh, dude, like, what were you doing? Like, you know, but um, but I've learned to just let it be what it was like. That's that's who I was in that moment. And I'm fortunate that it, it's serving people well. So that's more than enough. And I can evolve and, you know, try again in another book. Yeah. Ooh, that's a relief to hear. <laughs> we all have hope there. Okay. Um, I, I'd love to also talk a little bit about, because um, you touched on it a, a moment ago, about the your your well, your inspirations, but also your approach to writing and like how you capture those moments. Your writing accessibility captures the complexities of life and living for uh, not just me, but also three million other people mm-hmm. also agree. Uh, and at first, uh, you know, as we ha- had an opportunity to engage, uh, and enjoy listening to you read your own work, uh, it could be, you know, the, the accessibility of it could just be like, huh, huh hmm. it could be superficially, you could just dismiss that. It's just like, yep. huh. Uh, but just even the little bit that you talked about, you know, talk about Herman Hess and lyrical uh, qualities and structures and like what those commas are doing, like, you know, there's a craft here. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I think what's actually happening here is that you've captured and are, are really um, trying to communicate the value of understanding the self well, uh, and that being where you start to do everything else. That's not easy to do, uh, mm. especially well, so kudos there. Thank you. <laughs> uh, how do you go about striking the balance between being broadly applicable, uh, having your work be broadly applicable, but yet personally profound at the same time? Mm. Um, well, one thing is, um, every time I write something, I try to then filter it with minimalism. It's like, how many words are here that don't need to be here? And you're just getting rid of words, getting rid of words. And then eventually it's like, you get to the most like, uh, pristine carrier of the idea that you can then share. Um, but I think it's, I mean, it's tough. It's like, it's never a perfect science. It's more so a sense of feeling. And I think that's that's what I've been trying to go at and learning a lot from meditating is like the reason that um, I've been able to write in a way that touches other people is just because I've been examining my own mind. And I've, I've spent, I spent a lot of time meditating. I've spent, um, you know, the past 11 years meditating quite seriously. I meditate two hours a day, even right before we, I came to hang out with, with all of you. Um, my wife and I were meditating in the car for an hour because we were like, oh, let's let's get our evening sit done, you know, because we have a drive ahead of us. And um, but all that time meditating has really shown me that the spectrum of emotions that a human being can move through, that spectrum of emotions is pretty consistent throughout different human beings. What is different amongst us is how much time and how much intensity we'll spend in different particular types of emotions. So, you know, my primary reaction might be anger. For someone else, it might be the feeling of loneliness. For someone else, it might be the feeling of jealousy. For someone else, it might be different varieties of anxiety. So understanding that our structures are sometimes similar, and it depends, like there's definitely a lot of variance, but the movement of emotions that we go through you know, like you feel sadness, I feel sadness. Like you watch people get hurt and I watch people get hurt and we're both feeling empathy. And we're like, wow, how can we help? So that commonality in the human experience, like it's there. I love what Jiddu Krishnamurti said a bunch of years ago, I think in the 70s, he was saying like, you know, you think you're all different? Like you're all the same. Like we're all the same. Like we're all literally having the same feelings. And I think that's why when I'm, you know, I try to focus my writing around the, the language of emotion and people can see themselves because, yeah, they, they felt anger or, yeah, they've seen the way their mind plays tricks on them and tries to make arguments happen between friends or partners that don't even necessarily need to happen. Or you seeing yourself, you know, have a strong emotion and then project that onto the movie you're watching or the experience you're having and also coat that as negative, you know, so we're all, we're feeling quite similar things. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. So you brought up meditation there. Uh, yeah. and, uh, it just kind of leads me to one of these, uh, it's like, I, oh, great that I have the opportunity to ask. So I, I'm going to, uh, 
if you could be on a weekend retreat, a writing one or a meditation one, uh, with any three people, who would it be? Would Herman Hess be one of them? Uh, no, he would, he would, he would get the boot. Um, okay. no, it'd have to be, um, the Buddha as the chief teacher and then, um, Marx and Freud. I think, um, that would be a really good time. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. To be able to like ask questions and just see the way, you know, I, I always, I always find that not only is what a person is writing interesting, Right. People can they try to put their best forward in whatever it is that they're creating. But to be able to like spend time with an individual to see them in those in between moments, like you can also learn a lot from who they are, how they're like moving from one point to another or arriving to simple conclusions or how agitated they are or how calm they are. I think those. Yeah. Being able to spend time would be really cool. I would definitely pay to be a fly on the wall of that experience. Yeah. Uh, Young Pueblo, the Buddha, Marx, and Freud. You heard it here, folks. Wonderful. Uh, And since we're still on the topic of writing, uh, is there any specific advice that you would give to aspiring writers? Yeah. Advice number one, if you're really serious about it, you just don't stop. That's it. You just, you keep writing. That's like the number one point uh, differentiator of success and you know you have to sort of create your own idea of success of what what it is you're trying to get at um but the way to get there is you just don't stop and you see this a lot you see like you know whether it's people like you know working in government or podcast like whatever whatever avenue it's just like they just keep going they keep you know learning producing more work doing their best keep trying and then at some point they they get to you know a certain level of success i think um the other aspect specifically for writing is that in the beginning, the art of developing your own voice, like that takes time. Let it take, let it take time. Like it could take two, three years. And the first, th- first part of it is, you know, finding who you're inspired by and trying to emulate things in a positive way. It's still your own voice, but you're like emulating aspects of different writers. And then in time, you will develop your own style. And that's one of the beautiful things about writers is that like, yeah, everything's been said for sure. You know, like people are like so many things have been written about love. So many things have been written about so many different topics. But what's special about you is your perspective. No one knows this experience through your perspective. So you're free to write whatever you want about these important different topics because you are your own accumulation of conditioning. And that's, that's special to share things from your view. Thank you. Yeah. And I'm going to shift topics a little bit. Uh, in these next couple of questions. I uh, just want to come back to thinking about healing wounded communities specifically uh, as, as um, it's apropos given mm-hmm. everything that's happening. Uh, your writing encourages reflection in ways that invite us to confront how society systemically ingrains our behavior or shapes it. Moreover, your prescription for healing in your work resonates with so many because it offers it offers pathways forward. In these undoubtedly turbulent times, how can wounded, wounded communities and individuals more effectively mend? Mm, I love that. Um... At some point, retaliation has to stop. I think that is the, like, no matter what conditioning situation, at some point, someone who gets hit has to choose to not hit again, to not hit another. Because if you strike me, if you harm me, my immediate reaction will to will be to try to create the same pain within you. But then that just leaves us both hurt. And... I think that is what we've seen on the individual level and on the collective level. I like to think of humanity as this giant, giant web. And we often receive hurt, right? We're actively hurt by others, because, and, but we will then take that hurt and give it to another person. And we'll hurt them in some fashion. And like that hurt, will keep spreading in this giant web of humanity. But what's special about this moment is that as people heal themselves, 
they will have the power to, if it so happens that someone tries to hurt them and they are hurt, they will be able to process that hurt, transmute that hurt, morph it into a form of healing so that they then do not continue passing that hurt on to others. And I think that's the the place that we need to get within our communities, within our localities, like, and globally, is that we need to create that deep inner fortitude and understanding so that if hurt does arise, we know how to process it. We know how to heal ourselves and we can not have to pass it along. Very tall, tall task, but a really critical one. It's like, totally. It's incredibly yeah. difficult. And I, and I think like when I talk about these things, I always like to preface it. It's like, we're talking a hundred year game, right? It's not like tomorrow. It's not like, Oh, you're going to meditate like for yourself as an individual or for you, like, you know, or for the world, like you're, you're not going to do one meditation course and you're going to be all better, you know? And it's not like, Oh, one group of people starts healing themselves and they're going to be all better. It's, it's going to take a long movement of time for you to see, like, you'll start seeing results quickly, but to make big structural changes where more people can share in harmony, where more people can share in abundance, where less people are being harmed intentionally and unintentionally, it's going to take time. Just in your answer, you answered all my sub questions on that one. So, uh, but we we might have an opportunity to to come back in uh, the Q and a, but before we get to that, I, I, I'm going to introduce my wild card question. Sure. That's okay. I happen to know that you have a birthday coming up. Ah, uh, yeah. Happy yeah. birthday. Thank you. Uh, and with this, uh, it's a sort of personal interest I have in everyone who I have the opportunity to share a birthday with. I, I ask them the, the same sort of birthday mm-hmm. wisdom question. And it goes like this. What has surprised you most about the past year? And what wisdom do you hope to carry forward on your next trip around the sun? I was really fortunate. Um, This past year, I got to go to India for the first time um, for three and a half weeks. And I got to uh, go with a group of people who were meditators from all over the world. And, um, and, you know, we all meditate in the same Goenka tradition, but we got to go to all the major sites of the Buddha's life. So where he was born, where he died, where he reached enlightenment, where he gave the first discourse. And I was really shocked um, by how powerful that was. It like really, like I, I, don't, um, I don't think of myself as a Buddhist, but I take the Buddhist teaching very seriously. Um, to me, like, you know, so many hu- human beings have tried to understand the mind, but I think the Buddha understood the mind far, far and above every other human being, especially when it comes to the ending of suffering, to come, come on, coming out of suffering. Um, but the power of these places where I got to meditate at and, you know, staying at all these different monasteries and staying in these like, you know, the, like the simplest accommodations possible. And it, it was such a beautiful experience that, um, I don't know, I was just, it sort of uh, shook me back in alignment in a way where it's so um, like we get so caught up in this Western world and it's so um, like insidiously abundant. Um, it's so quietly abundant. So like, you know, being there and we were like literally in two of the poorest states in India. So getting to just like live that life, um, and obviously still like, like arriving there, obviously with like all your privilege and all that stuff. Um, but being able to like live in these monasteries and spend time with these monks and get to, getting to meditate in these places where the Buddha meditated himself and seeing the whole world come together like a lot of these places you'd have people there from thailand from sri lanka from you know from south america people from everywhere were there and it was just so powerful some of the deepest meditations i've ever had and um i think i'll always look back on that point um that specific moment in my life and just remember like if you feel like you're going the wrong way like try to get yourself back to bodh gaya and meditate under the tree because that'll knock you awake yeah. Wonderful. Thank you. Yeah, thank you too. That might be the perfect place in which to rest for yeah, us. Thank you. I want to thank you uh, and, and, and join the, uh, uh, ask the audience to join me in thanking you for your generosity and your time with us. Thank you. Thank you all so much. <laughs> thank you.